Happy then? Part two of Danny Laidley on Let's Talk. Around those years of 17, 18, 19, I was living as myself um, in all facets of my life except for my nine to five job um, in front of my children. So I, it, it got to the point where I was, I was ready for that. Um, Unfortunately, um, a few things happened um, and we never got to have that conversation um, before it became public. And allegedly, that was through the police releasing private photos and having what was a very private secret matter, not just become known by your family or friends or Victorians or Australians, Mm. but the world. The world. Like that. I like that. Um, it was a firestorm. And I carry the burden of that. Even though things were, some things were out of my control, I carry the burden of um, the embarrassment for my children and what they've had to go through. And that's been, that's been the most uh, difficult um, part of, you know, all, everything that's, that's happened. Um, yeah, un, unfortunate. Um, I, yeah, I, I suppose I've got to the point where, um, of the people who did it. Well, first, if I can go back, you know, I, I've paid my penance, um, you know, facing the law and an intervention order that I broke. Um, and it was really interesting with breaking that intervention order, um, I was the one who ran the police. <laughs> I rang the police and to say, it. I'm breaking the intervention order. <laughs> And they came around and got me. And then I went around back to the St Kilda Police Station and then the photos got taken. Was you ringing the police a way of fast-tracking the process of becoming Danny? Um, It's probably the sum of all parts. It... um, I was on a toxic dance floor and I wanted to get off. Yes. And I didn't know how to. And I, um, at that point, I'd now been diagnosed. Um, and the, uh, the added embarrassment on top was, now I was falling into a, uh, a hole of um, drug use. So I I didn't know what to do. I I was even more scared to reach out. And I probably reached out to, um, you know, some wrong people. Um, But, you know, I'm happy to put my hand up and have done and um, take full responsibility for all that. Um, The gambling and the drinking and the drugs was all, I assume, to mask what was an unbelievable amount of pain day by day. And that was the coping mechanism. Yep, it was. So the coping mechanism in the first part of my life was the AFL and... Work, work, work. Work, work, work. And then for that, from, you know, 2015 to when it became public, was, you know, uh, gambling, drinking, um, and then drugging. Um, Escapism. Yeah. Yeah. and then just finding yourself in this whirlpool of um, crisis. 
through the whole journey, what's been the most lonely or darkest moment? Um, there was a time um, really early uh, 2020 where I basically lived in my ensuite, my bathroom. I wouldn't come out. Um, and it's invariably where I planned um, uh, the act of self-harming. Um, I find that um, pretty hard to speak about. Mm. Um, I felt like I was the only person <laughs> um, in the world obviously I, I wasn't there was other people out there who felt um, uh, the, the rage um, that was coming out of me um, and um, blaming blaming others for for me being in the position that I that I was, um, and uh, yeah, that was pretty. That was that was pretty bad. Pretty bad. There are times when you're eight and nine days without sleep. Yeah. That's incredible to even say, let alone do. It's what happens when you're drug addicted. Absolutely. Um, I could work. I was coaching a local footy team. Um, I wouldn't... <laughs> yeah, I just didn't sleep. Um, but it strips you bare. It's the devil. And I, I, I can't believe that I got caught up in it. 2020, when you are arrested, your privacy was lost. What was going to be your pathway? Um, so once I was diagnosed, um, Ada then um, introduced me to a gender um, psychologist. So we started working through lots of issues and we started to talk about if the AFL would be interested in standing um, beside me. Um, so we put quite a bit of work into that, um, but it never got to see the, uh, the light of day because um, just after that, um, it became it became public. Um, so I was um, we were well on our way to reaching out to the to the AFL, um, and I have to say um, the AFL, led by Gil, um, have been just remarkable. Um, everyone, you know from club land to uh, the person from the top. And I'll never forget the first time Gil and I got together. Um, um, I sort of sat down and told him my story and he said, well, Danny, um, I don't know how you're still just sitting in that seat. Um, and then he said to me, um, do you still like footy? And I said, well, yeah, it's, it's, it's in my blood. Um, I've got a passion for it. And he said, well, as long as I'm CEO of this organisation, I will do everything that I possibly can to help break down barriers for you. Um, welcome back to the family. Like, and I, it just basically broke down. 
um, you know, from that. And then he added uh, on top of that, our game um, is for everyone. And I'm forever grateful um, to him for that. I really am. You were worried footy was going to kill you. Mm. It's quite the opposite, isn't it? Yep. At times, I I always thought that it would get me at some point. Um, invariably, it's it saved my life. Um, you know, I didn't have to live all those years in fear and shame and embarrassment. Um, I actually went to a transgender, um, my very first transgender event. I, I went there with a, a friend and I was sort of just in the background. I didn't want to draw attention to myself. And I saw um, a lot of mature transgender people with their tyres on, with their badges on, with the colours of, of the tribe on, and they were sitting there proud as punch. Now I would hate to have think what they had gone through when they were, were younger. And then it just got me thinking, oh, I've seen this before, I've seen this before, where past players come back and wear their colours at their football club and they sta stand there so proud of what they did for the people who were in the club now or the game. Yeah. Um, and I saw that um, with these transgender people and like it brought me to, to tears. Um, here's my new tribe and my tribe that's always been there and they're so similar. Um, one tribe is held up here, yeah. and the other tribe is not held down here, but the unknown about it. And I, I, I think they should be on the same level, to be honest. A couple of self-harming episodes in the last seven years or so, could you ever imagine getting back to that place again? Um, no. Um, the shame, the fear, the em em embarrassment that I, I, I carried for all those years, um, I'm past that now. Um, you know, I, I can be me um, and be this best version. And you know what, I'm, I, I'm still learning every day um, and still working on myself to um, enjoy what's the next 30 summers, if you like. You've got to this peaceful point through an unbelievably discombobulated journey. Mm -hmm. There must be a lot that don't find the courage or the bravery to become their authentic self. It's a sad thought. Hey, transgender people um, uh, something like 10 or 14 times more likely to um, attempt suicide. Um, and a lot of those don't make it. And we just can't allow that. Um, and, and, and I can only speak about my tribe, my m minority group. Um, we're all human. Um, and we, we all deserve to um, we all deserve to be loved and belong. Um, and I think um, if it helps by me being myself, um, um, 
it helps me be myself with the next um, generation if they have to live um, their life with less barriers. Um, I'll continue to be me. Um, I'm not going to go out of my way. I'm not going to go and stand on um, Parliament House uh, steps or anything that I will do um, it by being me and, and, and being seen um, and being known as a good person. Mm. Tell me about your 55th, how you felt completely free. Um, so it was my first birthday my whole life. I had to wait till I was, yeah, 55. Um, to, I had all walks of um, life, um, family, friends, people I coached, uh, people I played with, um, transgender friends, um, work colleagues, all in the same room. All in the same room. First time ever. First time in my life. And how easy was that night to talk socially, talk about um, uh, the footy. Uh, Mark Brayshaw's son, Angus, just played at the um, MCG because we were at the London Tavern. And then, you know, he walks off and we're over talking about footy, but then I'm talking about hair and makeup over <laughs> here or, uh, you know, and you just didn't, never got to do that. And then, Perfect. you know, my son got up and made, you know, the most beautiful speech. Um, yeah, it, you know, so, yeah, 55 years. So reasonable amount of time to wait, I would have thought. I can't express what a privilege chatting with you today was. You've shown us so much. I, you're an incredible person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Phenomenal. <laughs> Appreciate it uh, very, very much. <laughs> For more Let's Talk interviews, please visit afl.com.au forward slash on demand and search Let's Talk or visit aia.com.au forward slash Let's Talk. And the conversations will also be available wherever you access your AFL podcasts. And if you're experiencing mental ill health, we do encourage you to reach out for support. That support may be from family, friends, your GP, or a mental health professional. You can also seek further information and advice from the free and confidential support services listed on the Mental Health and Wellbeing Hub at play.afl forward slash clubhelp.